So the Republic of Armenia faced a full-scale military assault last month. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, so the morning of September 13, we woke up to the news that the Republic of Armenia was being bombed by its neighbor, Azerbaijan, which is several times bigger, much stronger militarily. And the last time we talked, Billy, we talked about the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, where Armenian Christians still live and where they're under siege from Azerbaijan. And I told you I was worried about an attack there in the disputed territory, you might call it. But what was really shocking about this attack was that Azerbaijan was attacking the sovereign, internationally recognized nation of Armenia itself. Um, so for 48 hours straight, bombs fell on the country without stopping. Cities and towns deep inside Armenia were bombed. 7,000 people fled for their lives. Hundreds of soldiers were killed. And we just, we didn't know what was going to happen. It was, we knew that Armenia was not strong enough to fight back on its own. And it was entirely possible that Azerbaijan was just going to invade and conquer the whole country. So it was a really terrifying moment. After 48 hours, uh, a ceasefire was imposed, apparently with the mediation of the United States, but the situation remains extremely tense. And I think it's important to draw that distinction that the last time we spoke, and we'll include a link to that discussion so people can go back and see, we were talking about a very specific area in dispute. This is an invasion of Armenia itself. And so this is a very different sort of escalation of this conflict. And before we get more into that conflict, let's talk a little bit about Armenia, because Armenia is a country born out of genocide. There are a lot of people who probably don't know much about that history. Would you mind just kind of going through a little bit of that to help us sort of understand who the Armenians are and how this country was formed? Sure. So before World War I, the country that we know of as Turkey today was controlled by the last Islamic empire. It was called the Ottoman Empire. And there were about a fifth of the population was Christian, and most of them were Armenians. Um, but when World War I started, the rulers of the Ottoman Empire decided that these Christians were a security threat, and they decided to liquidate them, essentially, to get rid of them all. So over a million Armenians were, were murdered, massacred from 1915 to 1923. Uh, Probably a million more were forced out of their homes, either deported or had to flee as refugees. Um, and so the vast majority of what Armenians would consider to be their homeland was lost to them forever. And all they were able to hold on to was this tiny little sliver of land that we know of today as the Republic of Armenia. And it has Turkey on one side of it, and on the other side of it, it has this nation, Azerbaijan, which is also a Turkish Muslim country, and it's the ally of Azerbaijan. So the Armenians only had this little sliver of land left to them in between these two enemies. Um, after the genocide, uh, the, the communist Russia, the Soviet Union, conquered Armenia and integrated Armenia into the Soviet Union. Uh, so for 70 years, Christians were severely persecuted, churches were closed, priests were sent to the gulag, um, and the country suffered uh, just a great deal uh, under Russian rule. They became independent again in 1991, uh, which is also when Nagorno-Karabakh became independent. Um, but so really this is, if Armenians are not safe in the Republic of Armenia, they're not safe anywhere. Yeah, and it seems like this has been obviously a region and an area and a country where there has just been nonstop persecution issues of, you know, really fearing the neighbors around you. I mean, that is a, that's a stressful situation. It's an unfortunate situation. And what happened on September 13th, there are a number of reports and elements to come out of that. One of the things that came out um, was what happened to Armenian female soldiers that was really disturbing. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So there's a video that was circulated shortly after the attack ended that showed some Azerbaijani soldiers desecrating the dead body of an Armenian woman soldier. And I won't say what they were doing. It's just really too horrible to describe. But um, just a few days ago, actually, another video came out that shows Azerbaijani soldiers on Armenian soil, and they've got seven Armenian soldiers captive. And these men have their hands in the air, and the Azerbaijani soldiers just start shooting, and they, they kill them all. Now, now the really twisted thing about this is this isn't like Armenia is spreading this news. These are videos that the Azerbaijani soldiers themselves produced and then they released. 
So it's pretty clear that this is intended to have a psychological effect on the Armenian population to show them, look, this is what we do to you. This is what we're coming to do to you. What What is the motivation for this, right? Because people are going to look at this and say, well, why is Azerbaijan doing this? Why are they going after Armenia still? Why is this? And I know this is probably a complicated answer question to answer, but I think that's that's the curiosity that people would have. Why this invasion? Why now? Why the continued barrage against Armenia? It is a long and complicated history, but essentially Azerbaijani national identity has been formed in opposition to Armenian, right? They're both kind of from the same part of the world. And when they go looking back on their history and they try to form their stories, they're kind of claiming the same land in a way. Um, but what makes it worse is that Azerbaijan, Armenia is a, is a democracy, but Azerbaijan is one of the most repressive dictatorships in the world. And as your viewers probably know, dictators tend to look for enemies to rally the people around. So under the current government, Azerbaijan has really made hatred of Armenians into a unifying national ideology. I mean, we have museums in the capital city of Azerbaijan that show Armenians with big noses and strange features, kind of like the Nazis did with the Jews before the Holocaust, right? Uh, you have state propaganda talking about how um, Armenians are committing atrocities against our Azerbaijanis. You have the president of Azerbaijan calling Armenians dogs and rats and promising to chase them out of our lands, quote unquote. So it, it really appears like this is a, a state-driven campaign to, to hold the country together by projecting hatred onto the Armenian people. Um, and as these videos show, when Armen Azerbaijanis who have grown up with this propaganda get their hands on real Armenians for the first time in their lives, this is how they act. They've sort of been conditioned. I mean, it's hard It's hard to not see the parallels between Israel and its positioning in the Middle East and what is going on here. I, they're very different situations, but still you do see those, those parallels, right? Absolutely. The main difference is that Israel is strong enough to protect itself, thank goodness, and Armenia is not. Well, and that's the that's the important you know piece of the puzzle here because the question emerges: Why should America care about this? But beyond that, and I think you know really more importantly, why should believers and Christians care about this? Mm -hmm. And this is the tricky thing where almost you can say the interests of the United States collide with our calling as believers, right? Because as believers, we should look at Armenia and say this is the oldest Christian country in the world. This is a country that's held on to Christianity through genocide through Soviet communism, through the gulags, and they're hanging on to life. They have some of the oldest cr Christian traditions in the world, and, and, and they need our help. They're our brothers and sisters. Um, whereas the United States is always looking kind of to, to diminish Russia's influence in the region, right? And they see an alliance with Azerbaijan and with Turkey as a good way to do that. So the United States is already involved. We already give military aid to Azerbaijan. We already are in a military alliance with Turkey. Um, so we're, we're all involved in this, whether, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and you know, th there's so much here when it comes to the, the faith aspect of it. And obviously, a lot of this is political. I mean, the question comes to mind, you're talking about the oldest Christian country in the world, you know, with Armenia, uh, but you're also talking about a clash of worldviews and religious views. How much of this conflict do you think is rooted in, you know, Islam versus Christianity? Um, it's a tricky question. I would say not so much. Uh, Azerbaijan is quite a secular dictatorship, um, and you don't see a lot of promotion of Islam by the state. But what, what you can say is that if you go back to World War I, you, you, in the Islamic empire, you had a system where Muslims are on top and Christians are second-class citizens, right? Um, and the reason the genocide happened is because the Muslims on top saw the Christians as a threat. And in some interpretations of Sharia law, if Christians are rebelling, quote unquote, against Muslim rule, then it becomes permissible to kill them all. And so that's one of the ways the government of the Ottoman Empire rallied support for the genocide among the people, saying, look, the Christians, the infidels are rebelling against you. And so we're still living with the echoes of that today. We're still in the situation that the genocide created. Um, and as a result, you have one of the oldest Christian, well, the oldest Christian nation in the world, a nation where Christianity is really at the heart of their identity. 
could be destroyed. It could literally cease to exist in the next few years. Well, and that, you know, that's compounded all of this by the fact that for so long, Turkey not being willing to really acknowledge, right? You have this horrific event with a million people being slaughtered and then pretending that it didn't happen is a whole other piece of the puzzle that um, is so troubling. But when we when we look at where this is now, because let's flash forward to where we are, we've had this conflict in September, there's a ceasefire. What is going on now? And where do you think we're headed from here? These are really crucial weeks and months ahead. Um, we think the reason that Azerbaijan has chosen now to attack Armenia is because the war in Ukraine is going so badly for Russia. Traditionally, Russia has been the only power that can really restrain Azerbaijan and Turkey in the region. But now Russia is tied down. They're losing very badly, rightly so. Um, and Azerbaijan thinks, you know, the European Union needs our gas because they're not buying Russian gas anymore. So Europe's not going to do anything. The U.S. is happy to see Russia take a fall. Russia's too busy. This is our time to take what we want, right? Um, so what's happening now, since the ceasefire was imposed by the United States, the United States has gotten very involved and they've been trying to bring the two sides together and force a peace treaty. Um, this is good in a way that the U.S. is involved. What we're very concerned about is that that peace treaty will mean the abandonment of Nagorno-Karabakh. And if Armenia has to give up Nagorno-Karabakh, Nagorno-Karabakh will be ethnically cleansed of Christians. That is just a reality. 120,000 people will either be killed or lose their homes in their homeland. Um, so what we really need is for the church in the U.S. to be engaged, to make their voices heard and say, the United States needs to help these people live in their homeland, not just get a treaty that will assure the gas flow, not just take care of the U.S.'s strategic interests, but make sure the Armenians can survive. Mm. And and I love what you said before that that sort of you know colliding of U.S. interests and the interests of believers when what we're called to you know loving others and you know being present and your organization Christian Solidarity International does such a beautiful job of that. One of the big pieces of the puzzle is being educated, which is why we often talk and we get a chance to sit down and you take us through these important issues. Where can people go for more information on this conflict, on this issue, and other issues around the world? We have a lot of information about Armenia on our website. That's www.csi-usa.org. We have some aid programs running in Armenia and in Nagorno-Karabakh to help people who are affected by the conflict. And you'll also find, you know, the statements that we've written about the war there. Um, yeah, if, if people want to contact their representatives, their congressmen, their senators, uh, they should tell them that you support the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh and their right to live in their homeland. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we so appreciate your time as always. Thanks for coming on today and breaking this all down. Thank you, Billy. Appreciate it.